Good morning and welcome to today's webcast, Self-Funded Health Plans, Shoring Up Leaks Can Reap Cost Savings. Before we begin, I will play a brief housekeeping video. Moss Adams is pleased to present another in our ongoing series of continuing professional education webcasts. Our presentation will start in a few moments. Before we begin, here are a few things to keep in mind. You can customize both how you view our presentation and how you interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can also adjust window size and placement. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons, each relating to a different aspect of our session. For example, you can click the file folder icon to download the group attendance sheet and a PDF copy of today's slides. You can ask our presenter questions during the webcast by clicking Q&A in the bottom left-hand portion of the icon bar and typing in your question. We'll do our best to answer all questions during the presentation or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty during today's presentation, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. We'll ask polling questions throughout today's presentation. Per the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy Webcast CPE Standards, CPE credit will be awarded based on your participation in these polls. To respond to a poll, click the button next to your answer. If you're attending this webcast in a group, in order to receive CPE credit, you must complete our attendance sheet available in the file folder icon at the bottom of your screen. Please have all group members sign the sheet and please remit only one sheet per group. Also note, today's session will offer you one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the requirements as specified by the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy. CPE credit can be awarded only to participants registered as themselves and is not available to participants who view the on-demand version. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon to open a PDF file you can save to your computer. We'll email a copy of your PDF certificate in two weeks if you can't download it today. As a reminder, the presentation you're about to see is not legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. I'm happy to introduce our presenters. Bertha Manahan leads our employee benefit plan audit practice and she works with a variety of plan sponsors on their benefit plan audits and consults on numerous benefit plan issues including health and welfare plans. She'll be joining us as a moderator today and is available as a resource. Will Norris is a partner in our healthcare consulting practice. He has been in healthcare consulting since 1991 with a focus on managed care and provider operations and payer insurer, medical group, and IPA environments. Will has extensive experience working within the operational infrastructure of managed care organizations, including claims processing, utilization and referrals management, eligibility, and contracting. Francis Oriudos is the senior manager with over 10 years of experience in the healthcare industry, working with all types of managed care organizations including HMOs, delegated IPAs, and health plans. Specific relevant experience includes managing several audit and recovery projects for Medicare and Medicaid plans that have identified millions of dollars in overpayments, resulting in immediate savings to a large delegated IPA. Diana Valdez joined PPC in July 2003 as an executive consultant. She utilizes her 24 years of healthcare industry experience, including 19 years focused on management of self-funded plans, providing PPC's clients comprehensive claim review of their healthcare benefit programs. Her past experience with large employer groups, including large governmental entities, provides a breadth of knowledge to the operational claim review and has been instrumental in her success in the healthcare administration arena. Bertha, I will now turn the line over to you to get us started. Thank you, Emily. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for being with us today. You're in for a treat. And I'm just going to briefly cover um, some learning objectives and our agenda today. For the next hour, we're going to um, review the self-funded plans, kind of what the trends, what the team is seeing, uh, looking at what a typical claims review looks like, strategies for mitigating risk. So that will help everyone to focus on what the processes unveil, what are the typical areas the teams are seeing in this area, um, and then go to medical and pharmacy audits, describing what, again, a typical audit would look like, 
what errors the team sees there, how to ensure financial accountability um, ahead of time and be proactive about that, and last but not least, understanding ASO contracts. So we have a full um, agenda, and I think you're in for a great treat. And we like to start with a polling question because we like to kind of start and see who our audience is to ensure that everyone um, gets to you know, learn something today. So what department do you represent? Human Resources, Finance, uh, Plan Administrative Committee for overseeing some of these you know, um, plans for, as a, from a fiduciary standpoint, or a mix of these. So I believe the poll should be open, and I'm going to give it a minute or two. And then we'll move it along. This is always tricky of how long we wait. But I think take a look soon. Okay. So we have a great mix, but it looks like we have a lot of finance folks. Um, no fiduciary governance, <laughs> and a little, small uh, percentage of combinations, but definitely um, human resources and finances represented, and often we see they have to work together in making sure, you know, um, participants are well served. So I'm going to turn it over to Will now. Thanks, Will. Well, thanks, Bertha, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, as a starting point, what I'd like to do is is provide a brief primer uh, to the concept of, of self-funding. I realize a good many of you on the, on the call today are familiar with self-funding, but I also anticipate that there are some who maybe not quite as familiar, um, and, and so I'd like to give this a brief overview. Essentially, self-funding is an insurance arrangement where the employer assumes the financial risk for providing uh, health care benefits to its employees. Essentially, it's an alternative means or financing a group medical benefit program, you know, moving away from a fully insured program. Uh, key element of this, in this situation, employers are paying for claims out of pocket as they are presented and or incurred instead of paying a premium to an insurance carrier. So it's essentially paying for services in more of a real-time uh, setting. Um, on the next slide here, so a couple other key points. Self-funding uh, essentially allows employers to reduce administrative fixed expenses, uh, which could primarily be considered the you know, health plan profit, uh, and, and retain cash until employee claims are actually paid uh, and or funded. Uh, there are there are certainly estimates out there of what the savings for being fully in, or, uh, for being self-insured are. Um, Typically, what we're seeing is the average runs around 9% of an insured premium to go self-insured, but we are seeing uh, estimates out there that go anywhere north of that up to 15 and, and 20%. So the, the savings are certainly significant, and like I said, a lot of it has to do with the elimination of the, the health plan profit. There's also a great uh, benefit in as far as cash flow since there is no premium payment being made and only services as they are incurred are being uh, paid, there is a, a, a benefit as, in as far as cash flow and, and in, to the tune of 20% of the insured premium. And one other, one other key, uh, key element of going self-insured really has to do with uh, when, when an employer goes self-insured, they engage the services of a third-party administrator to operate the plan. Many of these employers are not in the business of healthcare. They have very little knowledge of, of what it takes to operate a plan. So they get the expert, a uh, third party administrator to do this. And they're actually, uh, some of the responsibilities of a TPA might be to, you know, uh, distribute ID cards, process claims, uh, manage uh, membership, so on and so forth. So they, they have a big role. Um, again, but this is in a uh, different structure in the self-insured environment. So what we are seeing out there is a significant shift uh, towards self-funding. Uh, it is it's for many reasons that this is happening. Uh, in a large part, if I could summarize, it's for employers' desire to maybe manage their workforce health uh, to a greater extent. But the, but the reasons are many, and let me go through a, cu a couple of these. I, I spoke about cost reduction compared to being fully insured, and, and that is uh, that is significant dollars if it's done right. So that's kind of uh, pretty straightforward. 
One of the other big elements uh, is um, having control over plan design. Employers want to have more uh, uh, flexibility. They want to have more, be able to customize their plan for their workforce and the, uh, their workforce health. And they, they don't want to necessarily just settle for off the shelf benefit designs that come with the, come with health plans. They want something that fits their workforce and a self-funded plan enables them to do that. Uh, they can have that flexibility and be able to tailor it to their needs. There's also a desire to have data. You can only design a plan if you have the data in order to assess your workforce. Um, we're all hearing a lot about population health and wellness plans and so on and so forth. Well, uh, in fully insured environments, employers don't have that data at their disposal. The health plan retains that. So self-insured gives them the, uh, the ability to, to own that. A couple other uh, smaller uh, reasons self-funding. There's fewer state-mandated features. Obviously, self-funding is governed primarily by ERISA. And, and quite honestly, self-insurance costs are decreasing. It's becoming more popular, and with popularity comes competition, and with competition comes uh, reduction in costs. So um, health reform and ACA has nothing but increased the shift. Uh, states have accelerated some of those mandates that they have in place, but primarily the big piece of the equation is that ACA brought on, online a, a, a series of new taxes and fees. And by an employer going self-insured, they're able to uh, get them in a position of being exempt from these fees and taxes and really uh, eliminating to a large degree those increases. And I, I think the, the last piece I want to talk about self-funding is it's more smaller employers are becoming self-funded. There's been an increase in the number, and it's really because the small and mid-sized firms are going this route. And just the, the last point here is uh, when all is said and done, uh, it's roughly 61% of the employer-based uh, health care uh, membership is uh, in a self-insured plan or in, in raw numbers, that's actually around 97 million people uh, have a self-insured plan. And here we have just a uh, kind of a graphical representation of what's happening there. So you can see over the last uh, 15 years, at least in this, in this graph, uh, the increase has been rather dramatic, about 21% um, are, are moving towards self-insured. And again, it's primarily due to the, uh, the mid and smaller firms coming online. Okay, and we have another polling after Will just covered the stats. So let's see on which of these best describes the current state of your organization with respect to self-funding. So like greater than five, less than five, currently funded, but contemplating self-funding or you're full funding, fully funded and you're just here to join us for CP and our great expertise and, and the fund <laughs> today. That's always cool. <laughs> and you get credit. Sometimes CPAs don't get credit, so. Okay. We'll move this one along and see how everyone did. Wow, awesome. So 45% of the audience are currently self-funded. And it's a good mix between, um, you know, they, they've been self-funded under five years or they're contemplating both around 12%. But 45% have been self-funded for over five years. I think this is great to see. And thank you for your 12% of being here for CPE. We appreciate that too. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, <clears throat> so we've uh, we've talked about kind of the you know the movement uh, towards self-funding, the benefits and advantages, but we we want to make sure we we speak to the, the there are implications and risks of going self-funded, and and quite honestly, we feel a many uh, a good many employers move towards self-funding, hearing about the 10% plus savings, and they they don't really see the entire picture, or maybe they're not prepared for all that self-funding requires. So let's go through some of these risks. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, an employer bears 100% of the fi financial risk uh, when you go self-funding, uh, self-funded. Obviously, there are ways to minimize that with reinsurance and whatnot, but the point being that the risk is there. I mentioned that uh, part of the equation is outsourcing your, your uh, the management of the plan to a third-party administrator. And 
there is no larger uh, component of that uh, operating of a plan than processing of claims. And I'll tell you, uh, processing, uh, claims processing is a very complicated business. We as a, as a consulting firm uh, advise to the largest uh, payers out there, the, the brand names, multi-state, and they oftentimes bring us in because it is such a complicated business and they're seeking advice and and ways to improve. Um, we, we, we see firsthand the payment accuracy and how that can be compromised. Uh, so it, it, it's just a complicated business and it's borne out by the, the error rate estimates for claims processing are everywhere, anywhere from two to six percent. So pretty substantial. And the reasons for that, that the typical payer, the typical plan, uh, is focused on regulatory and compliance issues, uh, not on payment accuracy. They, they, oftentimes they have uh, no financial accountability, especially in a TPA uh, environment. They are transaction shop um, processing the employer's claims. So there's really no incentive for necessarily accuracy. I will say that um, a good many of the employers try and protect themselves by putting in place performance standards, but these are typically self-reported. The TPAs and the payers have, have somewhat gamed the system, so they're self-reported, and there's really minimal downside uh, consequence. So it's, these performance standards a lot of times really, really have no teeth. So what are the strategies? How can you uh, help to maximize your, your self-insured experience and, and optimize the benefits? And what we're talking about today is primarily the, the, the idea of conducting periodic audits of your healthcare claims and the uh, overall performance of your administrator. And there, there are many reasons for this. Uh, Francis will touch on a few, but, but some of these are actually stating the obvious, but I'll, I'll go through them. Uh, you have a fiduciary responsibility as a plan sponsor. It, it makes sound business practice. I mean, every organization should have effective vendor management, and this falls right in that category. It, it supports a robust internal audit program uh, by making sure you have controls in place over your self-insured uh, healthcare spend. Um, and then it, it's ensuring that your vendor is performing comparable to industry best practices. It's that report card, which really enables you to feel comfortable on how your uh, TPA is performing on your, on your behalf. Uh, lastly, one other strategy, um, it's not listed here, dependent audits. Uh, we, uh, we originally thought we were going to speak to that to some degree, but uh, we've got such a full plate uh, with everything we're talking about, uh, we're not going to go into detail on that, but we're happy to speak to you separately on that. Um, so, uh, claim audit headlines. I, I guess we're, before I pass it over to Francis here, don't take our word for it. The, the headlines are plenty out there speaking to, you know, the prevalence of, of self-funding and more importantly, the need uh, for organizations to be, you know, vigilant about keeping a watchful eye over their healthcare dollar when they outsource this to an administrator. Because at the end of the day, uh, self-insured is, is a lot more about being involved, being more involved and, and not less. So it really takes that active uh, engagement. So with that primer on self-insurance, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Francis to drill down into the concept of uh, claim audit and claim reviews. All right. Well, thanks, Will, and good morning, everyone. And yes, I'm going to talk about a medical claims audit here, as Will mentioned, uh, those in the headlines. And I'm going to speak about medical claims audits more in depth. And just as an FYI, I'm going to take time to talk about those in the next few slides. And then later in the presentation, Diana is going to speak to pharmacy audits in greater detail. So for now, uh, medical claims audits. And there are different types out there. Uh, first off, there are random sample audits. These are audits that we recommend the most, especially for groups that have not performed a review. These are statistically valid, and these are the same tests that we see that different states and even federal regulators use to evaluate an administrator's performance. Also, there are pre-implementation audits. Uh, these are done when new plans are installed. Uh, these ensure that a TPA has properly configured their system to pay claims correctly according to a new benefit plan. So specific categories of claims are run through a test environment, and the results of that test help the TPA 
make corrections so that when they do go live, when they are actually processing new claims live, uh, minimal errors are, are made and, and corrections are already put into place. Uh, next, we talk about uh, focused audits. Uh, we see these from time to time. Um, and these are reviews that target certain types of claims, certain claims categories, um, services um, specifically. So um, this audit is done after issues have come up with the TPA, uh, the, where the employer is finding out from their employees um, that they're having bad experiences with having claims being paid correctly. Perhaps they're getting wrong information from their providers. So in order to understand the origin the root cause and the magnitude of these errors, that's when a focused review will be requested by the employer. So for example, um, we've seen a plans make changes to co-payments um, for physician office visits for, from one plan year to the next, um, from, for example, 20 to $25. Uh, so a focused audit will target physician office visits only to make sure that those co-payments are being taken correctly. And then lastly, electronic reviews. Uh, these involve taking the whole population of, of claims data and applying certain filters and algorithms to all of the claims. Now, 100% um, uh, is, is somewhat of a misnomer because it's not to us as robust as other audits because, um, and when I'm talking about the other audits, I'm referring to the random um, and, and focused audits because those involve going to the TPA going to the location and testing claims on their system directly uh, with these electronic reviews, their desktop reviews, and um, they're, they're helpful in that they're able to determine whether certain benefits are programmed or configured in the TPA claim system correctly. Okay, so those are specific types of claims audits. And next, we're going to talk about um, your ASO agreement. And we bring up the ASO agreement, um, and this is the, the contract between the TPA and the employer because um, in the agreement, there are audit provisions which really drive the scope of a claim audit. And often these provisions are neglected when coming to terms with uh, the administrator. And so we highlight some key provisions um, that we think are, are important. So first off, um, the frequency. Uh, we see that uh, the TPA, uh, they may limit the time period for when um, an audit can take place. So we typically see uh, one audit per plan year. And with each audit, um, it usually is limited to a number of days. And um, the, the most, uh, the common uh, duration of an audit is, is about one week. Also, uh, the look back period. Uh, the look back period is the time period under review. Uh, the TPA, uh, we often see it uh, limit uh, the review periods to uh, the last 12 months. And to us, you know, this makes a lot of sense because you want to test the TPA as they are performing now, as they are performing currently. And if you find an error, you know, if you're doing a review three years back, um, it's possible that that error has already been corrected and a process or a department itself has changed. And so if you find issues that are old and stale, they may not be relevant to things that are taking place today. Also, um, the audit methodology is spelled out in the audit provisions, and this really has to do with the manner in which claims are selected for testing, either random or focused. And uh, we're seeing more and more um, TPAs actually limit claims audits to be random only, if you believe it or not. They really are trying to eliminate focused audits and electronic audits altogether. So just to keep in mind that uh, for us, um, we're seeing this as a relatively new development. So just to keep your eye out um, for that audit provision changing um, also, we have uh, this point about not, uh, the, the TPA is not being responsible for incorrect payments. Now, this is where we see administrators slip in language. I'm hoping it will not uh, go noticed. And what, what they're saying here is basically that if they make incorrect payments, that they're not required to reimburse the employer for those amounts. And, you know, it, we don't really see that often, but we have. And uh, we see, you know, it, it's pretty clever on the TPA's part. but. Um, we see that employers really should be vigilant to keep the, this language out of the ASO because part of the purpose of a claim audit is to identify payment errors. And if the administrator makes a mistake, uh, the employer sh really should be credited back those funds. Okay. And um, last piece here, we don't mention it on the slide, but wanted to mention performance guarantees. Uh, we just felt it's worth mentioning because 
administrators often receive bonuses for hitting certain performance metrics related specifically to claims processing. And we wanted to share with you what we see as industry standards. Um, industry standard metrics for financial accuracy, and, and that represents percentage of claims dollars paid correctly. Um, that's 99%. So financial accuracy, uh, the industry standard is 99%. And payment accuracy, which actually represents the percentage of transactions or the incidence of claims um, uh, completed correctly, we see the, the payment accuracy industry standard at 97%. So if you have PGs in your agreement, check them. And um, if they are different, it's worth having a discussion about aligning them with industry practice. Okay. So with that, I believe we have our next polling question. Uh, Bertha? Yes. Yeah, because we've talked about some changes. So what financial accuracy level was agreed upon for your performance guarantee medical claims? Let's see what y'all are uh, shooting for there. You have 99, 98, less than 97, and then you may not have performance guarantee metrics. So wait a few more and maybe I will close it now. So let's see. Ooh, Francis, I'm not sure if this is what you see in, in the industry. It's kind of a little even between 99, 98, and then uh, 53% almost don't have performance guarantee metrics. Yeah, so that, that's interesting. So, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, for those of you who have it below 99%, um, the, you know, the roughly uh, 25, 30% of you who do, um, it's worth having that discussion with your TPA. And um, for those of you who don't have performance guarantees, we know that there's pros and cons with having them. Um, and so, um, but if you do, just considering the fact um, that 99% is the industry standard. Okay, so thanks, Bertha. And um, next, we're going to talk about um, the process for medical claims audits. So um, oftentimes, when we talk about audits, um, there's a question of, well, what actually happens in the process? So we just want to take a, a few moments to, to walk through these different steps. So um, first, it really starts with the initial meeting uh, with the employer. And this is where you know, we take time to confirm the objective and the scope and approach. And here we uh, confirm the sampling method, the, num the number of claims that will be tested. And then the next step is to actually select the sample. Um, this involves working with the administrator to receive the claims data, and it requires them to, to run um, a really huge report from their TPA claim system for us. And that takes a number of weeks. And then from there, uh, we actually uh, take that claim set and select the claims. So, and again, that's based on the sampling method that we agreed upon with the employer. The next uh, step is uh, really the, you know, the meat of the process where we actually go on site and do our testing um, and perform uh, the claim review. And what happens there is that we take a team um, and we obtain read-only access into the, the TPA claim system, and we, we, we reprocess the claim sample to confirm that the claims are paid accurately. So we're functioning and operating as if we're one of the TPA's examiners themselves. And as our team has questions and findings, we're immediately able to, to share those with the TPA, and they're able to provide context and ultimately explain um, the reasoning and rationale for why a claim was processed the way it was. And then from the on-site review, there's a period where we validate findings. So usually when we leave uh, the TPA, there are just a whole host of questions and issues that the TPA has to research and investigate. Uh, this takes quite a bit of time, and so we will work with them post-on-site to complete the review and ensure that we have agreement about the observations that we've made. Um, at times, we may, we may even agree to disagree, but at least we're on the same page on how we will report those issues um, with the employer. And we really like to emphasize that we have a collaborative process with the TPA, and I think that uh, they appreciate that, that working process together. Um, and next is the final report, where we detail the results of the audit. We list which claims were overpaid and underpaid, and we provide commentary um, an analysis on the root causes and on the issues that we've found. And specifically for random audits, we're able to produce accuracy metrics and compare those with the performance guarantees that we just talked about. 
and, and be able to make comparisons to industry standards and even the self-reports that the TPA provides. And it, the audit doesn't end there, actually. You know, so usually you, you think of the final report that closes out the audit project, but um, in our case, what we like to do is work with the TPA to develop corrective action plans for the findings that we observed. And we do that at three, six months, um, nine month periods to ensure that whatever plans that the TPA put together to correct, um, that they're actually implemented uh, as, as stated. So oftentimes, you know, we all know we, we, we have good plans, but sometimes they go on the shelf. So for us, we like to follow up and make sure that those plans are completed and implemented correctly. Okay, so on the next slide, uh, we're going to talk about common errors that we find uh, during an audit. Um, you know, first off, uh, duplicate claims. Um, again, these are errors. These are things that we observe from an audit, um, and the most common. And uh, du duplicate claims are probably the most common of these errors that we see. And this is where providers submit bills multiple times. And you know, like like anyone, you know, everyone wants to get paid. They want to get paid you know, timely, and that's why providers are able to do that. But when TPAs receive those claims, they will pay them more than once. So um, this is something we see very regularly. A network contract rate errors. So um, this is you know t this is where TPAs have contracts with providers, um, and they have preferred rates. And these rates can be very complicated, and they're based on different payment methodologies, and they depend on the serv the, the different services that are rendered. So with each of these methodologies and each of these services, um, they're changing on a regular basis, um, often on a quarterly basis. And so because of these changes and how complex they are, uh, we see errors in how they are calculated. Uh, plan accumulators, um, and these are related to deductibles and coinsurance and out-of-pocket maximums. And we see these errors when changes are made to the claim by the provider. And this happens when providers make adjustments to the bill and they will resend their bill in. And when that happens, um, the, the TPA, they have, they have issues tracking those adjustments in their system and then recalculating the deductible and, and coinsurance amount. So that's where we will see a lot of issues related to plan accumulators. Um, application of physician uh, office copayments. Um, often we see there's an inconsistency how these, on how these are applied across uh, a claims population. Either the wrong amount is taken or sometimes they're not taken at all. And so we, with that inconsistency, uh, we see that um, you know, there, there's patterns of errors and again, uh, among the most common that we tend to see. Um, retroactive terminations, ineligible charges, and I'll just highlight too, coordination of benefits. Um, this is when another insurance is involved and, and the methodology applied for determining uh, which insurance has primary liability and the amount of that liability can be, can be very complicated. We see that very few TPAs actually calculate COB uh, correctly on a consistent basis. And two, most TPAs have a policy where they pay and pursue, meaning they will pay the claim first as primary. And then when another insurance is present, then they will coordinate the adjusted payment afterward. So if they don't have proper follow-up procedures, then that claim is just fully paid and it's paid incorrectly. Okay, so um, just highlighting here um, some of the most common errors that we see from a claim audit. Um, next, um, you know, we just want to highlight some triggers for a medical claim audit. Um, you know, the first one is, uh, first, if you haven't had one, um, we see that often as more folks, um, as Will mentioned, where there's a greater shift to self-funding, we're, we're finding that a lot of employers have not performed an audit. So um, it makes sense to, to check in with your TPA to see how well they're performing on your behalf. Two, um, if you've moved your administration to a new TPA, um, we often say that after the first nine months is a good time to test the claims process to allow for uh, a good number of claims to have come through uh, for that period. Also, service issues, um, we see this a lot being the basis for claim audits. Um, when you're hearing from your employees themselves 
that they're having issues getting their claims processed, perhaps they're getting wrong information from their provider, it's important to perform a review to really see how well or how big those issues are. And then lastly, uh, changes in the benefit design. Um, from what we see, whenever there are changes to a plan, there are, there's more opportunity for changes to the, the process for, for claims being adjudicated at the TPA, which in turn creates more opportunities for errors. So, you know, for all these things, um, anytime there are changes with your plan or with your administrator, um, it's appropriate to consider having a claim review done. And that's why from what we've seen that it's industry best practice to perform a review every two to three years. And actually, uh, the state of Washington actually has a requirement for certain self-insured self groups to have a review every three years as well. Okay, and uh, we're going to go to the next slide and just talk about a quick case study. I won't speak to it in great detail here, but um, I'll just speak to it briefly. Um, the background for this client was that they had a $14 million claim spend. They really didn't know what... Uh, the reason was for an increase in the cost, and we found from our review that they were not meeting their accuracy metrics, and it was actually well below what they reported and well below um, their performance standards. And also, we were able to find overpayments of nearly $200,000. So this was an audit that was, uh, you know, very fruitful. Um, but I also want to recognize, too, that not every audit uh, will show um, these results. And, and in many cases, we'll find audits that will yield fewer errors. And in that case, you know, it, it shows that your TPA has strong processes in place. You have a strong business partner managing your claims administration. But in cases like this example, cost savings are had, and you're able to identify true uh, financial exposure. Okay, so... Um, I've spoken a lot about medical claims audits, and now we're going to shift to pharmacy audits, which will be the remaining portion of our time. And I know that Deanna has a lot of expertise and experience to share. Um, and, but before we do that, I believe, Bertha, we have our uh, fourth polling question. So, Bertha, please take it away. Yeah. Thank you, Francis. Great job. So, yeah, has your organization completed a, a PBM audit, a pharmacy benefits management audit, since as he mentioned, we're going into that group. So into that area, we have completed an audit more than three years ago. We've completed within the last three years, we've not completed an audit. And I don't know what it is, <laughs> which could definitely be the case. Um, so let us know what you're seeing in this area before we dive in and talk about it. Again, it's good to gauge where everyone has been. Um, so I'm going to wait maybe one, okay, two more seconds because this might be... Ooh, so it looks like our presentation will um, be pretty informative, as only 7% or together 20% of you have gone through it um, in more or less three years, and some of you, 40% uh, haven't completed, and another 38% aren't as familiar with it. So, Deanna, I think it's a great time to turn it over to you. Okay, thank you very much. All right, let's move into Rx. Are your pharmacy benefits being adjudicated properly? A PBM audit will tell you. So let's dig into that a little bit. We've been talking about the TPA on the medical self-funding side, but you also have RX claims that are being paid. So let's discuss how the TPAs will pay your RX claims and what's happening in that world. So your RX are paid by a pharmacy benefit manager. And what is a pharmacy benefit manager? It's just the Rx TPA that is administering the drug claims for commercial, self-insured, Medicare, federal, state. In other words, they're everywhere. They are in the market paying Rx claims. So the American Pharmacists Association, it states that a PBM, a pharmacy benefit manager that's controlling and handling the administration of your Rx claims, they have four primary responsibilities. So let's spend a little bit of time talking about these four primary responsibilities and then we'll get into them in more detail in the following slides. 
So they're responsible for developing and maintaining the formulary. The formulary is key. What is a formulary? Well, it's the list of your prescription drugs, both your generic and your brand, and it's used by practitioners to identify the drugs that offer the greatest overall value. It's made up of a committee of physicians, nurse practitioners, and pharmacists that maintain the formulary. The formulary is specific to each PBM. It's also specific to each plan sponsor, and of course, particularly if you're self-insured. So the formulary is very important in controlling your drug costs, and every plan sponsor that's self-employed should really understand what the formulary is, what's in it, and how it's working in containing their costs. The second responsibility is contracting with the pharmacy. This is very important because you have to be sure that you have all of the pharmacies that really are in the geographic areas of where you have your members so that you're getting the best cost savings in the contracts with those pharmacies um, at, your, at your contracted rates. Then you have your negotiated discounts, not just with those pharmacies, but you also have rebates that are being done with your drug manufacturers. What are rebates? We're going to spend some time on that because it's a really hot topic in the healthcare market today related to drug pricing. Then finally, of course, they're processing and they're paying your drug claims. So these are the responsibilities of the PBM. So let's, let's get into the PBM a little bit more here. Let's find out where, where they came from and, and what's their background. Well, the first PBM was Pharmaceutical Care System, PCS, back in 1968. From 1968 to 1980, you really did not have PBM players in the market. They really started in the market in about the 1980s. We all know that since that time, drugs and technology have skyrocketed in the ability uh, to be able to uh, create and put out all of these different healthcare drugs that are in the market and that help us today with our disease and to keep us healthy. So as of 2016, PBMs now manage 266 million Americans. They're everywhere. So let's talk about where they are. They're in the integrated health system. They're going to be at Kaiser, at your VA. They're going to be at your retail pharmacies. CVS Pharmacy actually owns the PBM Caremark. United Healthcare has their own PBM, Optum RX. But overall, there's really only about 30 major PBMs handling all of these RX claims for all of us. And out of that, there's only three that are public that are the major ones. They comprise 78% of the market, and they cover 180 million. And those three are Express Scripts, ESI, CVS Health, Caremark, United Health Group, Optum RX. And then the fourth that you can't not think about is the Blue Cross Blue Shield Private, which is Prime Therapeutics. Whoops, I think I need to go back one here. Okay, so now that we've kind of got an idea of what is a PBM and what is a PBM doing for my pharmacy administration, let's recap a little bit on what these primary services are that you're paying for in your PBM administration. The pharmacy networks, they're building your networks. They're actually out there negotiating your AWP, average wholesale price, MAC, maximum allowable cost, ingredient costs, contracts with the actual pharmacies, dispensing fees. They are negotiating the pricing at your mail order pharmacies, or of course, most of them now own their own mail order pharmacies. Now key in these two pharmacy networks and mail order pharmacies are that these discount rates, they're huge in their differences. A retail is going to be sitting at an average of about 15% AWP. A mail order is going to go as high as 70% AWP. So again, when you are looking at your RX cost, it's very important that you understand or you have an audit 
of someone who does understand all of these different negotiations that are going on to be sure that you're getting the best discount for those high cost drugs that you're now paying for more and more in your overall utilization plan cost. Then you've got the formularies. The formulary is key. Again, this formulary, it is used to uh, actually identify what's going to go uh, into your generic or into your single source uh, drugs, into your brand. It's, it's really the driver that's going to define what you're paying and, more importantly, what you're saving. And then there's the plan design. So the PBM is going to implement that plan design to hopefully lower your cost by using generics with uh, multiple tiers. Then you've got your rebates. We're going to spend some time on rebates because this is the pool purchasing power that these PBMs, particularly the big three, use in really hopefully helping you to reduce your cost. But there's a big debate on rebates. Uh, particularly in the last couple of years where, uh, where folks are really trying to understand just what are they getting out of a rebate and are you even getting a rebate in your contract. And then, of course, there's clinical management. Now, we don't want to forget clinical management because that's where a PBM is doing your drug utilization review. And this is where you want to be sure that your PBM is doing what they really need to be doing for you. And that relates to pre-authorizing your drugs to make sure that the right drugs are being given, doing step therapy and clinical on the clinical trial drugs. And what we are finding today is that drug costs are up 102% over the decade. Last year alone, drugs spiked 14%. What we're also seeing is that the big ticket item is the specialty drugs. These are the drugs for the prevalent diseases like cancer and hepatitis C. And these drugs can cost $50,000 for just a course of treatment. Forecasters are expecting that half of the Rx bills in 2018, that's next year, will be these specialty drugs. So as a plan sponsor and self-insured, it's very important that in every one of these categories of what the PBM manager is supposed to be managing for you, that you're uh, understanding what these different categories are in the setup of drug processing and that you are getting the best cost savings related to these discounts and payments. So let's move on now. We know what a PBM is now. We know what the PBM is supposed to be doing for us. So how is it, this PBM that's paying for our drug costs, our drug bills, how is it different from the medical processing that we talked about earlier? Because there are two key differences that every plan sponsor should be aware of in how their drugs are getting processed. The first one is, the point of sale processing. Now in the point of sale processing, the key things are just that. It is point of sale. When you go to the doctor, you get your drug, you go, you get your, your drug um, RX, you go across the street and you fill it. At the point that you fill it, you are being billed. Now there are many things that happen after you're billed. You, you may uh, call your drug in and you may never pick it up. You may mail order that drug and you may get the incorrect dosage. All of those things are causing that particular drug maybe not even to ever be used by the member. But because it's point of sale, you're being charged for that drug. So it's important to really know what's happening in the processing of your drugs. And again, to make sure that adjustments are being made, invoices are being reduced, to really keep the cost down on your drug payments. The second uh, distinct risk in the RX processing that's very important is the rebate. Now, the rebates are where a drug manufacturer directly contracts with the PBM, or they might also own the PBM, like CVS Pharmacy and Caremark, and they set the fee pricing and the rebates related to the drugs that will be on the formularies. Remember, the formulary is key in understanding 
how it's being used to control your cost and in what you're paying for Rx drugs. So the drug manufacturers will pay the PBM a rebate when their preferred brand drug gets on this formulary preferred list and, of course, it has to be dispensed. Now, the PBM doesn't disclose the rebates that it receives from a drug manufacturer. Sometimes they will put in guarantees into the contracts that state that they'll pay a specific percentage of the rebates. Sometimes you're not even getting rebates and you don't know that you're not getting rebates. So that's where the transparency issue becomes the degree to which you can audit these PBM rebates to see what's really happening with these discounts that are being given. But the PBMs make it impossible to audit their secret arrangements for rebates, not just with the pharmaceutical companies, but also their network agreements with the pharmacy chains. So if the PBM is acting on behalf of the plan sponsor to negotiate the rebates and the network agreements, why keep the rebate agreement secret from the entity that you're working for? I think this is... Uh, something that Congress even right now is really interested in. Just last month, Senator Wyden uh, put into legislation the um, dubbed the See-Through Act. And this legislation was introduced because he said he wanted to lift the veil of secrecy around PBMs and their finances. So this uh, bill that is in Congress right now would force the PBMs to report the total amount of the rebates that they collect from these pharma companies and then the share of that amount that's returned to the health plans. So we can see that rebates today are really important even to our congressmen. So we as plan sponsors need to be sure that we're keeping an eye on what is the rebate and what part of it am I receiving back on the discounts that these PBMs are able to negotiate with either the pharmacies or the actual manufacturers? So talking about rebates just a little bit more to completely understand it, you have what's called spread pricing and transparent pricing. This is how the PBMs bill you, the plan sponsor. So transparent pricing uh, is something that we typically just do not see when we do audits and something that we really hope that in the future there is going to be more of. When we do PBM audits, we see spread pricing. So what is spread pricing? Well, that's where the PBMs negotiate with the drug marketer to get the lowest rate, but then they invoice the plan sponsor, the client, at a higher contracted rate and they profit from the difference, which is the spread. So this is how the PBMs are really going to make their money, is on that difference. So an example of that, and you can see this out on the Internet. If you go out and search on rebates today, there is a lot of information out there as people are finally really waking up to what are PBMs doing and what part is it playing in the cost of my drugs? So as an example, there was a plan sponsor that moved to one of these three um, PBMs out in the market. And in the first year, they saw an increase of $1.3 million, which really concerned them. So they brought in a third party, and they were fortunate enough with their third party audit to be able to get their hands on some of these secret arrangements. And what they found, as one example, is that generic amoxicillin, when their member went, again, remember, point of service, and bought the generic amoxicillin, they paid $92.53 to fill the prescription. That's what you as the plan sponsor would be paying for that drug. But then the PBM, they only paid the pharmacy that filled that drug $26.91. So the difference or the spread is $65.62. So every generic amoxicillin drug that they were paying for the PBM was getting a spread of $65.62. That's just one drug. 
that that is what has caused even Congress to really be taking a look at rebates today to say, what is the PBM actually keeping and how much of that are they sharing with their client? And it's very important as a plan sponsor that in your contract you really understand rebates and that you're putting penalties in if those rebates are not being met according to what you've put in your contract. So moving on here, our time is getting a little bit short. The um, transparent pricing I've already talked about, it really isn't in contracts today. Hopefully we will see more of it where you're actually really just paying a flat administrative fee and you're paying for the exact purchase price. So very quickly, let's talk about a couple of other things that are really important in a PBM audit and that you should be doing as the plan sponsor. Just as on the medical side, how oh, the contract is so very important. But let's key on some things in the contract that you really need to be sure that you're doing. The key one is make sure that your discounts and your dispensing fees are in the contract as a guarantee and not as a target. The PBMs will always want you to do a target. They'll want you to do an aggregate discount of all the category of the different drugs, whether they're generic or brand or specialty, and they'll want a, uh, a percent on a rebate guarantee, again, not specific to the type of drug. And they'll want it to just be a target, which of course just means that if they miss the target, there's no penalty to them. You want to be sure your contracts state that they are actual guarantees, and you can, not like the medical world where they do their own internal audits, you can build your PBM contract to say, if you don't meet that target, you're going to pay me the difference. So it, it is really a key item to look for in your, in your uh, PBM contract. I'm having trouble with my next slide. I don't know if you all, there it is. Okay, so why conduct a PBM audit? Let's go back through it. Accuracy of your claim payments. It's very important. There's a very high cost that you're paying now on your Rx. You need to know, um, you know, whether you're meeting those contractual agreements. And you need to confirm the adjudication on your discounts. It's very important that you understand how the discounts are being created by your PDM and that you're getting the higher percentage on those discounts. Again, remember, on the retail, 15% is the average. On your mail order, 70 is the average. If you're not hitting those numbers, then you do not have a good discount in your contract and you need to renegotiate. Your plan design. You want to be sure that the plan design, particularly as a plan sponsor that's self-insured, as a plan sponsor that's self-insured, you can build that plan design with multiple tiers for your co-pays. You can work on that formulary and make sure that your generics are, are, are listed as they need to be listed and that your pharmaceutical companies aren't squeezing those single source brand drugs into the formulary so that in the background with that spread, there is more profit going to the PBM. Uh, it's very important that you have someone that's really helping you with your PBM contract and making sure that the plan design fits all of the other components of the, of the drug uh, processing that goes on before that payment is actually made. And of course, you want to identify your errors in a claim payment review because there will be claim payment errors, whether it's medical or whether it's Rx there are going to be errors that are made, and it's just due diligence to go in, not just the medical, but on an RX audit, and make sure that your dollars are being spent wisely. Also, we don't want to forget the DRU. 
again, that's where you've got your pre-authorizations, your step therapy, your age limits, your day supply, your refills too soon. There are all kinds of protocols that a PBM should be applying to each and every drug that's prescribed. And you want to be sure that those protocols are really implemented. Later, we're going to see just a couple of sample cases. And you can see where pre-authorization alone can cost the plan a significant amount of money if the PBM is not handling the BRU process accurately. We've talked about rebates and some pretty uh, detail. And it is a hot topic and one that I think that every plan sponsor should be on top of right now as we hopefully move PBMs to a more open, transparent processing of Rx and where all the dollars are going and being spent. And then, of course, you've got your uh, performance guarantees. And, and you want to make sure you don't have targets. You want true teeth in these performance guarantees so that you can get that difference in the savings if they don't meet um, those percentages that you've got set. So, Deanna, as we can um, Deanna, I'm going to jump in now because I think um, we're at our schedule time. So, and the folks are going to have our slides, and Emily's going to cover some things. Um, do you have some just closing remarks, or do you have a slide that you want to absolutely cover live? Otherwise, the participants are going to grab everything. Yes, just the very next slide, and I will close with make sure you have a look at this case study, because you will see the dollars that were found because of the preauthorization. So I hope that today's presentation has just given you a real desire to want to really get in and pick up your PDM contract and look at it and make sure that the dollars that you're spending are, are well spent. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Deanna. Emily? Great. Thank you, Bertha. And thank you also, Will, Francis, and Deanna for a great presentation today. Uh, we covered a lot of material, and we are right at the top of the hour. So if you have any questions, feel free to enter those into the Q&A box now, and we can follow up with you, with you after the presentation. Or feel free to reach out directly to any of our presenters. And as a reminder, if you attended today's presentation in a group and would like to receive CPE credit, you must complete the group attendance sheet found in the slide deck and hand on, handouts icon to the left of the slide window. If you participated as an individual and met all certification requirements, your certificate is available to download now in the CPE progress window to the right of the slide. I'll keep the webcast console open for a few minutes to give you time to download your CPE certificate. A copy will be emailed within two weeks should you have any difficulty downloading it now. And here is a link to an online survey where you can provide feedback for today's presentation. Please take a moment to complete the survey as your feedback is very important to us. Thank you all for joining us today, and we hope you'll join us again next time.